get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders, some you've heard of, Steve, some people have never heard of, and some they've heard of. So we have Noah Alper, who started a large chain called Noah's Bagels. And Steve, what I love to hear about are some of those challenge stories, like not things are hunky-dory, um, but how people push through. And, and Noah, Noah's Bagels turned into Einstein Bagels, and he told me, though, when he first started, he was selling religious tchotchkes out of the back of his trunk. That was his humble beginnings. And so I love hearing the humble beginnings of things. And, you know, Tony Horton from P90X talked about, yeah, we know he, he sold hundreds of millions of whatever programs, DVDs uh, for P90X, but he talked about making money to street mime. That's how he made food and rent money. He would put his head on the street and do street mime, street performing to make his food and rent money. So that and many more, check them out on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. Um, and we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners by running your podcasts. So it actually generates amazing relationships, amazing content, and business. Um, so podcasting, though, for me, see, is much more personal. It was, you know, obviously, I formed amazing relationships out of this, but it was my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, and him and his brother were the only people to survive out of Nazi Germany from their family. And... Um, there was an interview done by the Holocaust Foundation. So his legacy lives on because of an interview. Um, and so his interview is on the about page of inspiredinsider.com and um, you can check it out, but it really inspires me to, I consider when I have a guest on, I'm helping them and myself leave a legacy beyond ourselves. So if you are interested in podcasting for your business, go to rise25.com and learn more. And Today's guest, I'm excited to introduce, um, before introducing today's guest, Steve, he's got, I mean, seriously, decades of amazing experience in marketing and growing companies and growing brands. I just want to thank a big shout out to Nick Araco, who introduced us, and they have an amazing peer group and provide knowledge sharing to CFOs and CHR, you know, CHROs all over North America for over 20 years. You can check them out at AchieveNext.com. Um, Steve Dobbins is the founder and CEO of the Dobbins Group, and what they do is they help companies solve marketing challenges. And for over 20 years, he's worked side by side with CEOs to help grow brands. They work with companies over the past decades like IBM Watson Talent, Swims, YPO, Vistage, and many more. And his collective team of the Dobbins Group, um, I'm not going to say, Steve, they're even more impressive, but they've worked with amazing companies. Um, you work with AT&T, Johnson Johnson, DuPont, and the MBA. They bring that world of experience into working with brands. So, Steve, thank you for joining me. Great to be here, Jeremy. You know, I want to talk about swims, but before we go into swims, because you essentially, you can go in and you do a multitude of things, right? You have provide CMO work. You can go in and help revamp social media, messaging, brands. Um, and so we'll talk about swims, but especially during this, you know, kind of crisis mode, hopefully coming out of crisis mode, you've helped people navigate this crazy time. So I'm wondering what the types of things people are calling on you to do and help them with. 100%. Great question, Jeremy. So we call ourselves an agile marketing agency, which has been super important during this crazy pandemic. Um, we, uh, you know, we're a virtual organization that can grow and shrink as we need to. So pretty much any uh, challenge that a, a client will come to us, we can, we can find the right people. And I just leverage people that I've worked with throughout my career, kind of the best and brightest, uh, and bring them on board. Uh, so I've got a great crew. But this has been a really, really interesting time. Um, we've actually grown significantly during, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, had a, you know, the first couple of weeks, we, we we're about to sign a few clients and those went completely silent. And then suddenly we started, you know, getting phone calls and people coming to us and saying, you know, I've been thinking about marketing for a while. I really haven't done anything about it. We're stuck. Uh, 
can you come on board and help us? Uh, so we're really working with clients to a navigate through this um, crisis, which is just absolutely unprecedented. Making sure that they uh, don't go dark, that they don't lose. Um, you know, they're all facing some economic hits, but making sure that we kind of minimize those. And most importantly, really setting them up for success on the other side. Uh, so we've had just a really interesting group of clients. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. You want to go into that? Yeah, go into some examples and what, yeah, what they wanted you to do. One of my favorites is uh, it's a company called Casco Contractors. Uh, they uh, specialize in tenant improvements. So it's a contractor construction organization that also has a design arm. And they really have, have focused on improvements to you know, office spaces, et cetera. So there was a really natural pivot uh, as soon as, you know, business, as soon as we got the shelter in place orders in California, um, they kind of looked around and like, what's an obvious fit is how to make our um, workplaces safer and healthier for the return. Uh, so they came to us, they had no, they really were doing no marketing. They're really successful. One of the uh, top uh, contractors in Orange County so didn't need to do a lot of marketing, but they were starting a completely new initiative. So Cheryl Osborne, who's the CEO, uh, just an amazing story. This powerhouse woman in a, a man's world uh, is, is leading uh, Castle Contractors. And she had a vision. She's like, this is an opportunity for us not only to you know, stay steady, but to really grow and really position ourselves and be an ally to, you know, our clients old and new. Uh, so we went mm. in, met with her, shot some quick videos um, while keeping social distancing and, you know, built a website within eight days, had a full campaign ready to go. And I think we launched six weeks ago. She's been, you know, featured in LA Weekly. We got her on Orange County Business Journal. Uh, and she's getting calls all the time now that as we're starting to finally ease up some restrictions, businesses are like, oh, shit, what happens when we're all returning to work? Our employees don't feel safe. What, we, what can we do? We've got all, you know, we've, we've got all these office spaces. What does it look like? So she goes in and does an assessment and helps them, gives them a full range of ways that they can, you know, uh, retrofit their 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 workspaces. Uh, so it's been great. She's a, she's a wonderful CEO with a vision uh, and, you know, just open to all of our creative ideas. We've had, we've had a lot of fun with her. You know, I love that because it's like a lot of companies are now seeing the need to pivot and grow, you know, with a different initiative from what they had before. And you kind of bring that, that leadership, the, the marketing leadership together to help them navigate what that looks like. So they kind of came to you with, here's what we're thinking. And you kind of built out this whole program around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what would you say from talking to Cheryl? Um, so there were some takeaways. You said she, you know, she's a woman leader in a man, like in the construction or contractor industry in a man's world. What were some of the things that struck you about her as a leader and running the company? Well, I think she, you know, she's able to use some of her soft skills in a, you know, it's, especially in this time when, when empathy is probably the most important, when we're all kind of worried about health and safety, she leads with that. And she leads with you know, mm. great integrity about her own business and how she, you know, she made a commitment. I'm not laying off anyone during this pandemic. I mean, I'm, you know, no matter how much we suffer economically, I'm taking care of my people. That's first and foremost. That's the message mm. that she puts out to all of Orange County. Uh, she wants to help fellow CEOs. So she's speaking directly to CEOs uh, to like, Hey, we, your people are your most important, um, you know, asset. Let's take care of them and make your place as safe and healthy as possible. Hmm. Um, Steve, what's another one of people if someone came to you in, in this uh, craziness? Yeah. Um, another one we're working with Kinemagic, which is a uh, VR company out of New Orleans. So they do uh, virtual reality and XR and they were, solely focused. They, they launched a product in February. Uh, it's a digital twin technology and they were focused on oil and gas. So it, would, it was a company that was completely, um, you know, dependent on oil and gas, which at the same, you know, when COVID came in, oil and gas also tanked. So it just went completely crazy. Um, they have pivoted and have re recast themselves as uh, virtual teams. So they create virtual spaces, so meeting rooms, whiteboard spaces, 
planning, all that sort of thing, um, specifically for, for any teams. And they're making it accessible. They just had to change their technology a slight bit to be open to anyone from whether from originally a direction of going to you know, massive projects uh, that were multi-year projects to being, you know, almost anyone could, um, could take advantage of the products. So that's been a lot of fun to watch them. They had their panic mode and then came through it with just like a new vision. It's been really cool to watch, again, the CEO kind of take the you know, leadership and find some, way, learn ways to innovate. Walk me through a bit of the process. So they call you and what, what did you help them with? Yeah, we were working with them on a, we were working with them and um, I mean, on any, on any client, you know, we kind of, we first, we go through a, they, they may come with one set of problems um, and we do a, a uh, you know, kind of a dig deeper call where we'll explore what the really issues are, what their issues are. And, 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 you know, through conversations kind of you typically uncover, there's a lot bigger there. They generally will start with something tactical but they probably have something strategic that is a much bigger issue and probably have some challenges with how they're messaging. Um, so we like to help them step back and take a, you know, a real a 360 view of their, of their uh, challenges. Um, and generally we love starting with messaging. We, we consider ourselves first and foremost storytellers and helping brands tell their stories and then like absolutely back it up with, uh, you know, all the different marketing channels and metrics and data uh, that, that feed into that story. But it all starts with having a, having a, a beautiful brand story. Yeah. You guys go deep and I want to hear your thought process because I know you have, like when you bring in marketing strategy and execution, you bring in these specific foundational frameworks to working with someone. And I think in weird analogies, Steve, like when I, when you, I heard you say that, I think in weird health analogies. So I'm picturing like, I don't know why a freckle that like is discolored mm -hmm. and then you go in and you take a biopsy and there is an issue there and you have to dig like, and there's this whole thing underneath the surface. It's kind of what you do in the sense of they go like, yeah, this, this email thing's off. And you're like, uh, yeah. And your messaging and the whole, you kind of, when you dig deeper, you find these other underlying foundational issues. So, if you could talk about just some of the phases you put people through with this process. Yeah, we generally love, when we have the freedom to, we love to start any new engagement with a messaging workshop and we create a messaging playbook. What we, do is we, have a, we have a three hour workshop that we you know, use a variety of interactive exercises to really pull apart you know, the, the DNA of the brand. So we'll, we'll gather together the, obviously the CEO, um, we like to have about five or six of the key stakeholders participating in this because they all have a different view. And what we really quickly uncover is, you know, not everybody's on the, not everybody's aligned. So, you know, marketing doesn't, marketing in an unaligned organization doesn't do any good. You know, of course you have to have an alignment around who you are, what you do and why it matters. And from all creating that framework, um, really helps you to, to create much more effective marketing, but also much more effective um, communications within your own uh, messaging internally and how you work as a team. So we, we start with that. Uh, we go back and create a, a messaging playbook that we present to them a week later. And it turns out to be a really cool interactive experience for the team, not just for us, but they, it's proven to be a great like bonding experience for them. Uh, CEOs are kind of sit back and marvel what they're what they hear from their team, uh, but that's a great foundational um, uh, practice for for any projects that we take on. And I love I love just we we started off with you know tasking the CEO to to tell the story of the brand, and it's not just the story of the brand; it's your story. So if, especially if it's a founder, founder CEO, how, how did we get here? How did we get to today? And really treat it like a compelling story and that just feeds so much into the, the narrative. You know, and from there, so from the messaging, yeah, go ahead. The other tools we use that we love, personas, um, really uh, helping teams understand who it is that they're, you know, selling to, who are they speaking to? So your marketing is not, you know, having a real understanding of, the challenges that your your customer is facing, 
what are their pain points, and how are we helping address that? So really kind of giving a, a creating a, you know, persona marketing is, is one of my favorite things, just like actually having a, you know, a face and a name that you can actually envision whenever you're creating marketing. It just makes it so much more um, empathetic and uh, effective. Awesome. What's next after that when you work with someone? You know, simultaneously, we're also just doing deep dives into the actual metrics. So going in and looking at their systems, what systems they have in place. Um, invariably, there are, you know, uh, brokenness in the systems. Uh, you know, their email's a mess. They may have, uh, you know, haven't scrubbed their email list in, you know, a decade. Uh, they're doing things just in, you know, wasting time, uh, not being effective in their marketing. So there's, there's just all kinds of great stuff. There's so much great uh, data you can collect from marketing that most companies are probably not taking advantage of. So we love, you know, not only just doing the creative side and the messaging side, but digging into the, the metrics and um, data behind all of their, their existing marketing. Probably there's a lot of stuff we were talking before we hit record. Oftentimes people neglect their email, you know, and that's a one-to-one -one communication. Is there other things um, I know that you have um, social media solutions as well. Yeah, you know, in social media, it's always a, it can be a hard sell because people don't see necessarily the quick, um, you know, return on social media, but it is, you know, not having a social media presence is, is, is you know, in itself giving a brand statement and, you know, no one, I mean, that's, it's, it's the world we live in. Uh, it also allows you to be like super nimble in your messaging. It makes you, you know, direct contact with your end user, your target. Uh, and you can just, you know, brands can have a lot more fun and be um, a little bit freer in social. So we, we, we love uh, the social media component. But what all, are mistakes people, yeah, go ahead. But it all has to tie in together. I mean, nothing, nothing lives in a silo. So it's, you know, what is your piece of content? What is that content journey? Uh, whether it's a blog, how it gets used in email, how it gets used in social, um, which does it like uh, turn into infographics? Is there webinars around it? But you know, it's all about how can you, how many ways can you leverage good content? How do you? What mistakes are people making in their content marketing? Um, I think uh, again, doing it in a vacuum, not leveraging it the way they they should, and not tying into the metrics behind it. What, you know, you can have a great email that gets a great open rate, but are, what are you learning from it? So we want, you know, every piece of marketing to have some kind of learning from it. You know, what did people click on? Uh, what did they respond to? What was the time of day? What did, you know, what are all the different um, data points that you can learn and get better about and, you know, better serve your, you know, your end customer. So there's messaging, you look at the messaging, the persona marketing, and then the different systems that are going on simultaneously. What else? Yeah, we'll create a, you know, we'll create a whole um, content engine, content calendar, um, putting together uh, actual you know processes for development of content, and just you know turning it into a well-honed engine. Um, again, most organizations just don't really have that, especially especially at the level that that five to ten million um, dollar. They probably have someone junior doing their, you know, sending out a newsletter every week uh, that is featuring a product versus, you know, really providing helpful uh, information. What's some of the most important, you know, when you go in, there's, that's probably can be overwhelming for people, I imagine, because there's so much stuff you could do. What, where should people start with their content? Oh, it also depends on, you know, what industry you're in, who your target audience is. So I think mm -hmm. first is understanding who your, who your audience is and looking at what their pain points and creating content that don't just try to sell your services, but show that you're empathetic and that you're a trusted partner and that you provide value. So getting them there, getting them hooked uh, before, you know, so they come to you for when they're, when they have a need. Yeah. So yeah, the mistake you feel people make is maybe they just push out their own agenda or products too much and they're not looking at it from their client's perspective of what would actually serve them, what questions are they having and what pain points do they have? Yeah. Um, 
what else when you go in? So the messaging persona systems, the content calendar. We'll, we'll do a, we'll do a competitive analysis. What can we learn from the, you know, looking at the landscape, what are others doing? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? We'll do a real, um, you know, current state assessment and be very blunt about, you know, this is, this is what we noticed. It can be, it can be challenging for, for people to hear, <laughs> uh, but some are better than they think they're, than, than they even think. They come to us knowing that they have some issues. Uh, we put all that together into a marketing, you know, developing a kind of a, a, a you know, 12 month marketing strategy around that all, you know, using all of those pieces. You probably had to have a lot of, I don't know, hard conversation, but like, you know, just showing someone, I don't know if this is the right analogy, Steve, but like, it's not so much their baby's ugly, but sort of, I guess. Um, it's a tough conversation, right? Um, maybe your baby's not perfect is a better analogy, but, um, what are some of the hard, you know, to mention the person's name or company, but talk about some of those hard conversations because on one hand, they're coming to you for advice. On the other hand, you want them to listen to your advice. And if you come at it in the wrong way, they may not be as open. So maybe if you could talk about maybe a tough conversation you had to have and how you navigated that. Sure. I mean, I think there's, again, there's, it goes back to my many, many years working straight with CEOs. So knowing kind of how to have those conversations uh, and also, yeah. understanding that the, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, diplomacy that goes with any kind of marketing leadership. So, you know, you're never going to just like slam everything. Uh, there's always something you get to find. So you can find, you know, find the, find the good things to compliment them on. And then, you know, then you can ease them into the, the realities and come with a solution as well. Come with like hope. I'm like, Hey, you know, this actually needs a lot of, a lot of work, but it's absolutely possible. And I think some of the hardest, some of the bigger challenges are when, you know, like, when the CEO has been handling marketing his or herself, <laughs> um, or they've created systems or they've created a, you know, they're, they were hands-on in the development of a website or a logo or whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, now they've grown and it's not, you can't have this uh, uh, ragtag marketing that's, you know, got them to where they were. Uh, but you typically, by the time they, they're at the size that when we start talking to them, they're, they're willing to hear the, they know they need improvement. They're looking at, the, at their mm -hmm. landscape and know that they, they want somebody to be honest with them. Yeah. They're ready for help sometimes, but I mean, sometimes they aren't maybe ready to hear what you're, what you're willing to share either, even though they know there's a problem, but, um, but I'm sure that at least they've reached out and they want the help, I guess. Right. Uh, not, you know, and what, honestly, not everyone's a good fit. Um, I think we're, we're always looking for people that are, that are wanting to work with us, that respect our uh, opinions, that are willing to also have, you know, be, you know, have a difficult conversations with us. I mean, we want, yeah. we want you got to be a level of trust and candidness um, and you need kind of for, you know, for this relationship to work. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about, swims in a second but is there anything else that you want to touch on in in the process that we didn't hit um, again every every project every client is completely unique so we really pride ourselves being a again being an agile agency of being able to provide a unique solution yeah we have systems that we you know a lot you know, a whole toolkit of things that we can use um but not everything applies to everyone so you know that ability to to really identify what a, what a client needs and having those conversations. You know, Steve, I know there's a lot of people prob there's, there's a number of companies in a position kind of like swims was where they maybe weren't ready to hire a full time kind of head of marketing at this point. Um, and maybe it would take, it could take a long time to find that person also, even when they're ready. So they need your team to come in, step in and kind of lead the marketing efforts. So I'm just wondering, like maybe take swims as an example, um, because you have to quickly go in and assess everything, kind of like triage everything and like move forward quickly. So talk about the experience and, and what you do with swims. Yeah. So swims is a, 
global lifestyle brand. They specialize in these amazing waterproof shoes and loafers. Uh, they were founded in Norway, got bought by private equity. Um, private equity hired a CEO in Long Beach. He, all of his marketing team was in Oslo. Uh, I got introduced to him right as he had taken, he'd taken the job like three or four months earlier had no marketing here in, in, in the United States. And really his goal was to, to grow US sales um, specifically. Uh, so he, we, he and I started talking, we hit it off, um, quickly ran, came into, had an agreement and you know, with an understanding that he was eventually gonna hire a, a head of global marketing, but that could be a year down the line, which, which it turned out to be. Uh, so he and I worked again, side by side. Uh, I was part of his leadership team working you know to connect the dots between marketing and sales and product development uh, so i was brought in my full team uh, writers and designers pr people to kind of do the assist uh, and we became his you know fractional marketing agency so he had a whole marketing team at his disposal without having to have any headcount added uh, while he waited so we we did a, you know had a really fun time going in making it, doing the assessment. We did exactly what I just explained. We did a messaging workshop. We did personas. We did a, you know, uh, competitive analysis, uh, created a content engine. Uh, and really quickly within you know, probably a month, we were up and running and, uh, you know, taking their uh, email marketing, especially social media, um, as well as, you know, their uh, website, uh, doing upgrades to all of, all of those things. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And we had, you know, we had no, he was, you know, cautious community. We had, we had no experience in footwear. Um, but that's one of the things that we love too, is just to like, tackle a new industry. Um, we kind of use that journalist uh, ethos to go in and dig and learn and quickly learn uh, a, a, any new industry. So we, that's how we got into technology, um, real estate, now like, um, construction, uh, all brand new industries for us that we've been able to come in and work with the CEO and quickly understand the industry. It's interesting. I mean, the foundational principles apply to any industry, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What's interesting too, Steve, is that you do a really good job and you work yourself out of a job. Like you do a good enough job, you put everything in place and then they're like, okay, you did amazing, Steve. Bye. I mean, so how do people work with you ongoing past that point where they may bring someone else in? Yeah, and we actually did keep it with swims. We have, we're, we kept for another year and a half of working in more of a um, execution, but we knew all the systems. So I had, my team members were already well placed in and they knew every system that swims had. Um, so we, you know, kept on. So we all, you know, we always want to have that ongoing relationship, even if they hire someone new. Okay. Yeah, because I'm like, wait, that's terrible. It's great for them. It's terrible for you. Great. Like, you just hand it off to the next person, the keys keys to the car or whatever. Yeah, yeah. but we also like, you know, there's always there's always something on the horizon. And, and you know, Jake Brandman, who is a CEO, has been one of our biggest uh, supporters and has referred yeah. to numerous uh, other clients. So, you know, we're, we're almost 100% referral base. Uh, so that's, you know, it's building those, it's all about relationships. Yeah, no, totally, totally. And, and I'm sure there's always ongoing things or oversights and everything. I think, I think of the analogy to like the chiropractor, you, you fix someone's back or you help their back, like, well, they're never coming back to you. So you did a great job, you know, but if you educate them, just like in your, your situation, they know they need some kind of maintenance, you right. know, and the people who understand that that's what's needed. Right. Um, you know, you talked about the journalist background, and so you have a journalist background from University of Texas, right. where I actually almost went. Um, I went to Madison, but um, I thought about going there just because the food's amazing. Uh, the barbecue alone, I would go to University of Texas. Um, but how did you go from journalism, and then you went to YPO? Yeah, so I... I was, again, at University of Texas uh, from day one, was on the Daily Texan, which is a amazing, probably one of the top three college newspapers in uh, the United States. Uh, went to work for them, loved it, uh, made my way all the way up to editor, managing editor my junior year. So I had 150 people working on a daily newspaper that was that competed with the wow. paper uh, and really figured out that my love was not necessarily for the day-to-day -day reporting, but the management side of things. Uh, so, 
you know, senior year switched focus a little bit uh, and went on more of a communications versus straight journalism. And that's what brought me into, into YPO as a writer. Uh, so I helped them launch a, new, a magazine uh, and, you know, was doing, you know, editorial work for, for YPO, you know, all around the world. And then mm. that's paved the rest of my career. You know. What was the toughest part about managing that large staff while you were at the University of Texas? I think uh, juggling all the different personalities, it was the toughest, but also probably the most fulfilling. Um, I loved, and I still love leading teams. Uh, so that really gave me my first uh, glimpse of what leading teams would look like. I, you know, I, I yeah. pride myself with like creating amazing teams that are, you know, the right, have the right, all the right talents and kind of creating diverse uh, diverse group. So, you know, there w could not have been a more diverse group than the, the team we had at the Daily Texan. Lots of Pulitzer Prize winners. Um, yeah, super proud of, of, of them. Talk about your team at the Dobbins group and how you assembled the team. Yeah, so they are 100% um, individuals that I've worked with at various parts of my career. So a lot of them have worked together. So they're really, I consider them the kind of the best and brightest. The people that I have great relationships with, that I have a trust already built in. Um, I know their work ethic. Uh, they know mine. We know how to communicate. There's no challenges. They all have, you know, they're all have their own independent businesses as well. So they're, you know, don't depend just on the Dobbins group. But, you know, we're I'm bringing them a lot of work. So we we work great together and build, you know, build really cool teams. Again, yeah, it's just like there's we never skip a beat when a new project starts. Yeah. I want to kind of get some of your favorite stories because you have a really amazing, have an amazing career so far from YPO starting Spin Creative and then again at YPO, then Vistage, then <laughs> Revolution LA. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And tell me about going, working at YPO, doing your own company and then going back to YPO. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So I, yeah, I was at YPO for seven years. I uh, absolutely loved it. It was a dream job. I, you know, I was in my 20s and traveling around the world, you know, working with some of the most I mean, just amazing business leaders. Uh, I just had, you know, direct exposure to them. Uh, it was fantastic. But I was, you know, living in Dallas and I wanted to live in what? I wanted to live in California. And at that time, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody worked remote. It was not ever, never thought of anywhere. Uh, so I went to LA, uh, really not even having an, a concrete plan of what I was going to do. I was going to get to work. I was going to work at an agency. Um, got a contract job with YPO at the you know as I was leaving, that LA will give me a little bit of a cushion, and that led to the creation of Spin Creative. So for the next I think 11, 12 years, I had Spin Creative, which was my first agency. Uh, we did a lot of work still with YPO, and then kind of expanded our, our reach. We're very event marketing focused, uh, so traveling around the world. Uh, so it was, it was a, uh, I love the adventure of working for myself uh, and then also, but, you know, still getting, you know, in the diversity of clients. Uh, did that, you know, for 12 years and then YP brought me back as their chief marketing officer. So it was kind of, I went from an intern in, uh, in my 20s mm -hmm. to CMO um, in, my, in my 30s, which was, you know, just mm -hmm. an incredible opportunity as YPO was, uh, expanding its global reach and its public profile, lots of lots of cool opportunities. It's interesting. So when you went to LA, Steve, you have a little bit. It sounded like you had a little bit of plan, but not much. What was it? Was it a big leap for you to make that decision? Be like, I'm just going, or what? What were you thinking at the time? Yeah, it was a big leap, and it was very counterintuitive. I'm a Virgo. I don't. I always have a plan. Uh, so going and not having an exact plan. Again, I had I had the cushion by the time I actually made the the move, uh, but I you know I had contacts, I had I had friends, and I had some um, business contacts that I figured you know, and I had a little bit of savings, might as well you know let's head west go for the the, the, the American dream, uh, and, it, and it paid off, and that kind of gave me a, a impetus for the rest of my career where it's really made it easier to take those leaps. So, what was the conversation like with YPO when they? 
uh, I don't know, lured you back. They're like, okay, we want you back. And what was that? What it was that conversation? It was awesome. And I, in fact, I had a Zoom call with uh, the CEO at the time uh, yesterday. Uh, David Martin uh, gave me a call. I was still very familiar with, you know, I was working in, within the organization as a contractor. You know, Spin Creative was doing all of their international events. We were very much ingrained in, in the organization. Uh, and getting that call was, for me, it was a professional, it was a huge opportunity to expand my own, you know, um, you know, digging into PR, global marketing, um, and really, you know, grow considerably. And I, I certainly did over those, those seven years. You know, a shout out, I had uh, Sean McGinnis on, who's um, president at uh, YPO, and it's just shout out to YPO because they're an amazing organization. I mean, I think last time I researched, and you could probably correct me, see that I think there's like over 27,000 members, um, like executives and other people for, like that are in the organization. And these are like top, top companies in the world. Sean is a dear friend of mine. We actually, he was one of my clients when I had Spin Creative. He was head of EO. He was our international president. Uh, he and I worked together. Uh, I was doing like their annual reports and stuff. We never met face to face until I was back at CMO and he became COO. So we, we were served on the senior team of YPO together. So he's a great guy. Mm. Mm, totally. What, what things have you learned from talking to Sean? You know, Sean's a, a real master of, of servant leadership, uh, of empathy. He is a relationship builder. Um, he is calm and collected, but, um, you know, also has a, has a vision. Uh, and just, yeah, just a, a great guy. Yeah. So what's some of your, fa what's a favorite story from your YPO days? that you remember maybe interaction with the, the management or maybe interaction with a, one of the, the members of YPO. My favorite, my favorite story was uh, working in 1995 in South Africa and I was given the task of bodyguarding for Nelson Mandela. So that, that's my favorite. Are you serious? Yeah. He was a surprise. He was a surprise speaker at an opening cocktail party and they needed someone to make sure that no one rushed the stage. So I escorted him in. Uh, so yeah, it was I know you did an Ironman or half Ironman and everything, Steve, but like, you know, are you going to be fending off like uh, <laughs> crazy people? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not, not, probably not the best bodyguard in the world. I think he, I think he, has, <laughs> he has his own bodyguards, but, you know, I like to tell it that way. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, was, what was that uh, event like that he spoke at? Oh, it was amazing. It was my first time to South Africa, first of more than 50 or 60 times. Um, I had a deep love for South Africa, a deep love for Nelson Mandela, who is uh, probably my number one role model as a leader um, of mm. empathetic, empathetic leadership and um, vision and tenacity and, uh, you know, just incredible. So, he, yeah, he, he was a highlight. And the next morning we had um, FW Clerk, we had... Um, you know, Desmond Tutu, Jane Goodall. It was a, it was a powerhouse, um, eye-opening week in South Africa that, again, I think has been inspir inspirational throughout my career. What did he talk? You remember what he talked about? He just told a story. He was, you know, this is 1995. He had just um, become president, so it was a, you know, his story of of leaving prison and his hope for a, a new South Africa and, a, you know, the early days of its democracy. It was, a, it was extraordinary. Wow. That's amazing. You need to update your LinkedIn profile, Steve. Mention that. Former, bodyguard. former Nelson Mandela bodyguard. <laughs> I can't believe I left that off. Yeah. I mean, I'm really shocked you left that off. Actually, we need to update it today. Um, Vistage, you then went on to Vistage. So what, what are, what's a favorite story from Vistage? This is, it was amazing. Vistage, another really amazing organization that sits in the same space as YBO as far as peer-to-peer -peer, uh, leadership. Um, and they really gave me an opportunity. I went in, left marketing a little bit. I was uh, more entrepreneurial. They put me in charge of, of coming up with various strategies to um, Add it to the member, add it to the member experience, and create value streams for for members of Vistage. 
uh, which was completely out of my normal, you know, traditional marketing. Uh, so it was a great entrepreneurial um, opportunity. I think it, uh, again, gave me some, some great room for professional growth and building a business um, and, you know, great contacts. A lot of my current clients are Vistage members. I'm still a Vistage member. I'm a huge believer in uh, YPO, Vistage, EO, all of the peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, organizations. Um, and then you can't help yourself, but then you create two more companies with Revolution LA and the Dobbins Group. Um, tell people about that, that company, which is, it seems like it's a yoga-inspired fitness company. Uh, yeah, so Revolution uh, was, uh, my husband uh, launched it. We launched it together. Uh, it was a it was sort of a Tom's Shoes meets Lululemon. So every okay. piece of the workout clothing had a um, social give back. So you have a pair of leggings that provides, you know, a week of school for a girl in Thailand escaping trafficking, or you have mm. shorts that's providing um, uh, work skills training for a teenager in uh, San Diego. Uh, so we launched that company. Uh, and really I was, I left Vistage and was planning to start, you know, look for a CMO role uh, somewhere and realize, you know, I was like, let me do the marketing for Revolution for the first three to six months while we get it launched, and then I'll go off and find something else, and, you know, and go back full time somewhere. And that's when the Dobbins Group started. It was really, I don't want to go back to work for anyone at this point in my career. I want to. I've done an agency before. I can do it again. Let's see where we go with it. And you know, four years later, it's going incredibly well. You know, some of the hardest things I think is to launch a company. Right. And what were some of the strategies and things you used to get that off the ground? Yeah. Well, I think in both the case of Revolution and with the Dobbins group, it was first finding you know, that just like I would with any other client is finding, you know, what is your story? What is your brand ethos? And really understanding who you are as a brand uh, and then working from there and creating from that and making sure that every aspect of the company connects to that DNA. Um, so especially with Revolution, which our tagline was uh, love in action, everything from the logo to the, um, you know, every product tag to every, you know, marketing, you know, collateral, you know, spoke to that bigger vision of creating a better world with our purchases. You know, mm -hmm. There's so many meanings, right? Obviously, people are in action, but the, also the purchase creates love in action, too. Exactly. How long did it take you to come up with? I mean, right now you say it, no, oh, it's like, makes perfect sense. It probably took you like 70 hours to come up with that. My, no, I have to give my husband complete credit. He actually, he was the, he was the CEO and founder. I was president. Uh, and he worked mm -hmm. on it. He had his social, he had his MBA in social entrepreneurship and was working on the concept for four or five years. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was not an overnight. No, totally. What helped with the selling? So you have the messaging in place. Now you need to get the word out. What helped sell? Well, it's, you know, it's a understanding your marketing channels. Uh, it's building a tribe. We did a lot of in-person events. So being, you know, at yoga festivals and interacting and creating that excitement. And, you know, it was a, it was a lot of, of on the ground work. Uh, which was fun. And it was also you know, super rewarding. But yeah. So yeah. Especially with a lifestyle brand. Yeah. Um, the Dobbins group, what have we missed or some companies or stories from the Dobbins group? Let's see. Right now we're working with, um, great organization called Alliance Resource Group, which is a staffing organization for people and uh, leaders in the finance and uh, accounting uh, realm. Uh, and they are hard hit by, you know, nobody's, nobody's hiring right now. So it's, it was interesting. Maybe started working with them about a month ago and have loved teaming with them. It's a, it's a husband and wife uh, run uh, uh, business. Uh, we're working you know, side by side with them to kind of just navigate through this. Uh, they, you know, again, we're went on, on um, the track to like have just record breaking year 
uh, and then just immediately, you know, like everyone when when COVID hit, uh, just some some major uh, halts. But slowly, we've been working for about a month. We're already starting to see things turn around. So watching their vision and watching them being comfortable in the uncomfortableness uh, has been really wonderful. And you know, their trust level they've given with us has been absolute uh, collaboration. Uh, what helping them, you know, create empathetic brand messaging that also has you know that's that's getting the results that they want. So they're they're starting to see obviously you've seen a lot of job people hunting for jobs. Uh, but slowly starting to see more and more people uh, actually thinking about hiring. So looking at the looking at the um, horizon when hiring starts again, which is already starting. Uh, but looking at yeah, especially Q3 and Q4, what those might look like. Thanks for sharing that, Stephen. And first of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing your your decades of knowledge with us and your thought process. It's so valuable to hear how you go about going in to basically help a company. Um, I have one last question. Before I ask it, I want to tell everyone, go to the Dobbins group, okay? It's Dobbins-group, D-O-B-B-I-N-S-group.com. Check out what they have going on. You can read some of the stuff about their messaging workshop, their social media Kickstarter, their brand strategy, and what they do as a fractional CMO and come in and basically kind of take a a full service approach to your company. So check it out. Um, So thanks. Thank you, Steve. My last question is, um, you know, we can't do this journey alone. And it seemed like you are, you've seen to go to these amazing organizations and help them. Who are some of the mentors along the way that really helped you give, give you advice along the journey? Yeah, I would think, um, you know, certainly, my peers at YPO, I think of Buddy Teaster, who was the CEO of, of Souls for Souls, has been a great inspiration throughout my career. We started YPO way back at the same time. Um, I saw him on the call yesterday. Uh, and then, you know, YPO members around the world who, uh, you know, I'm still close friends with. Uh, they are continue to be inspiration uh, with what they're doing in their careers. And then my, my Visage group. Uh, you know, I super, I have a lot of value, get a lot of value of it on a you know, regular basis, especially we're meeting on a weekly basis during uh, COVID-19. Uh, and it's been a super, um, super important and it's a great asset to, you know, really balance me out and be my own uh, personal board of directors on a regular basis. Steve, thank you so much. Everyone check out Dobbins-Group.com and really appreciate you. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.